We are macroeconomics lecture number five. I continue today with two five. This is chapter two, section five, interest rates. And interest rates I usually like to abbreviate with IR. So this is a very short section. Interest rates, there are many different ways to think about interest rate. So, interest rate is the price that we pay for borrowing money for a given period of time, usually one year. So, the price of borrowing money. When we talk about borrowing, a different way to think about it is rental. So, this is the rental price of money. So, there is a difference, you have to understand the difference between interest versus interest rate. So, interest is the compensation for borrowing money, the compensation for using other people's time. Oh, sorry, other people's money. The interest rate normalizes that for one dollar and it normalizes it for one year. In other words, the interest rate is a normalized representation of interest. So, if we borrow, let's say, one thousand and a year from now we have, oh sorry, we return eleven hundred, we have an interest rate of 10%. So the interest rate is usually measured or denoted in percentage terms. All right, next, there are very many different interest rates. You have an interest rate, let's say, on government bonds, which are supposedly the safest instruments. You have interest rates on corporate bonds. You have interest rates on low quality corporate bonds, which we call junk bonds. So you have a wide spectrum of interest rates. In macroeconomics, we simply like to talk about the interest rate, as if it is only one. But in real life, it is not one. It's dozens and dozens of different types and variations of interest rates. So sometimes in economics, we simply consider as the interest rate, the risk-free interest rate, usually, uh, usually returned on a government bond, maybe one-year bond, maybe 10-year bond. Okay, let's see. As with GDP, we have uh, real versus nominal interest rates. So, a nominal interest rate is not adjusted for inflation. It uses the current prices. Let's provide a short example. We borrow 1,000. Interest rate at 10%. And here's the key, this is a nominal interest rate, gives us 1100, let's put in a dollar sign here, and a dollar sign here. So this is interest rate which is nominal. If we have inflation, let's say, of 6%, this means that our real, real, interest rate will be equal to 4%. So, what you have is a elementary connection or relationship between real interest rates, inflation, and nominal interest rates. So, nominal interest rates simply equal inflation plus the real interest rate. A different way to think about it is you simply get the real interest rate by subtracting inflation from the nominal interest rates. It's 
simple as that. Of course, there are some more complicated formulas, especially if you're working with three months or three years, but this is fairly simple and good enough for an introductory macro course. So, what is characterizing the real interest rate? It is characterized by the purchasing power of money. So, if you lend 1000 at the end of the year, your purchasing power will increase by 4%. So, in real purchasing power adjusted or inflation adjusted terms, you're going to be beginning from 1000 will be $1,040. So, real interest rate means adjusted for inflation or adjusted for purchasing power. This means how much your purchasing power increases with some consumer index, usually uh, taken to be CPI, Consumer Price uh, Index. Okay, and the next uh, essential topic is that of the expected interest rate. So, the one of the most important variables in macroeconomics is the expected interest rate. In other words, interest rate, an alternative way to think about it is the cost of capital. In other words, the price that you pay to borrow money. So money, the essence of money in this sense is that of capital. So the interest rate is the price of capital. And the expected interest rate is what people expect to get as a return for their capital. Why expected interest rate? Very simple. If we're lending money today, for example, for 12 months, we are lending, let's say, at 10% uh, nominal interest rate. We do not know today what will prove to be inflation. In other words, what will actual inflation be over the next 12 months, we don't know. We do have some expected inflation and we may say we expect that inflation will be 6%. If the expected inflation is 6%, then the expected interest rate will be correspondingly 4. But if the expected inflation is only 2%, then the expected real interest rate, real interest rate, will be for 2% inflation, 8. In other words, the expected, I should put in here, real interest rate, the expected re uh, real interest rate is not no, simply because we do not know in advance what in the future inflation will be. So, we do lock in the nominal, we know it's 10, but simply because we don't know inflation, we can't say what is the real interest rate. Therefore, we have expected real interest rate based entirely on inflation expectations. Uh, in essence, one might say that this is, in some sense, a driving force, the expected real interest rate, but I want to get into this today. All right, so that's completing chapter two, and we move on to chapter three. So, chapter three is productivity, output, and employment. All right, so from Productivity, Output, and Employment, Chapter 3, I'll cover Section 1, Section 5, and Section 6. Section 2, 3, and 4 is particular to the labor markets. As I explained some lectures ago, labor markets uh, are the focus of Keynesians and New Keynesians. Uh, I am more of an Austrian, so I'll focus more on capital markets 
the financial system, the banking system, on interest rates and capital. So in this course, you'll be getting a little bit more of interest, uh, capital, business cycles, as opposed to labor markets. Again, this is the type of the course, at least, that I do. So, uh, first one is, as was explained, or at least I explained some time ago, we're moving to the world of economic analysis. So far, all we did was basically say how things got measured. So we were in the world so far of measurement and providing simple definitions. Now we're moving to economic analysis, which in simplest ter terms says how the world works, how the economy works. In other words, all we're trying to do is explain the workings of the economy. Now, let's move on to 3.1. 3-1, the concept, the key concept for 3-1 is the production, sorry, function. Is the production function. And the production function simply provides the relationship between inputs and outputs. It represents how economic inputs translate into economic output. So in a sense you have Y and Y usually stands for output or production. Y simply equals to some parameter and then a function of capital and labor. So, the concept here is factors of production. If you would remember, we said a couple of lectures ago, one of the key factors of production is capital. Another key factor of production is labor. We also mentioned land. For some economic purposes, land counts as capital. And occasionally, as a factor of production, we uh, also include natural resources like oil, natural, I'm talking about crude oil, natural gas, etc. So sometimes natural resources are also considered factors of production. So what this production function provides is the relationship between the quantity of production factors and the output. So, the quantity of production functions or factors of production, we call these inputs. So, factors of production in microeconomics are sometimes called or better known as inputs. So, again, capital and labor are inputs and Y represents output. Output is the same as product, is the same as production, is the same as goods and services. Okay? So, let's see what else we have. All right, so the functional form and also A represents another key concept and that is the concept of productivity. Productivity is important to understand, is sometimes very confusing. Sometimes you have pure productivity and pure productivity means the output as it relates to both labor and capital. In other words, if we fix the quantity of capital, 
we fix the quantity of labor. This year we have one output, and next year with the same capital and with the same labor, we have a new, hopefully, higher output. This increase in output with keeping identical capital in labor is sometimes what we might call, or some economists like to call, pure productivity. There is also capital, capital productivity. Capital productivity is a similar concept. We keep capital constant and possibly by increasing labor we see what is the marginal increment. Similarly is with labor. Labor productivity. Again, you keep the factors fixed, you let one factor move and you see what is the increment in productivity. The probably most important of all these types, which uh, at least I like to think, which is slightly different, but usually, uh, let's say, the preferred, the easy way to think about is productivity per worker. Productivity per worker has one extremely important implication. It determines the wages or it determines the wage level in the economy. A different way to think about it is that it determines the standard of living or the standards of living. So, productivity per worker essentially means you get total output and you simply divide it by the number of workers and you get the average productivity per worker. The marginal productivity per worker means, okay, this is what the productivity is, we add one more worker in the economy, what is the marginal productivity per worker? For all purposes of macroeconomics, it's nicer to think of the average, because the average productivity of workers is what determines the wage level, it is also what determines the standards of living. So, let's talk about journalists a little bit. Any journalists here? So, journalists love to point out that... Nothing wrong with journalists, guys. Journalists uh, in, in media love to point out the government could simply raise salaries by 10%. Well, the government cannot raise salaries by 10%. If the government could raise them by 10%, here is the killer question. Why not raise them by 10%? 20%. Well, if they, it's in their power, why not just double them or just triple them or ultimately make everybody infinitely happy? The answer is the government cannot. In the macroeconomy, only the productivity of workers determines the overall wage level and the overall standards of the economy. So people just clamoring for the government to give them more money is not going to change the standards of living overall. Of course, some group can extract some money and benefit, but it must necessarily, by the law of scarcity, which we also used to call trade-offs, if one group gets to benefit more, some other group has got to be hurt. The only meaningful way for a government to increase the standard of living and the wage rates for the macroeconomy is to increase the average productivity per worker. So, this is probably, again, one of the most important concepts in macroeconomics. Alright, so, let's see what else do I have. 
Okay, what, what next do I have is the shape of the production function. Again, I don't want to get into great details. The shape of the production function. So, I do assume that you've seen, at least in microeconomics, production functions. So, when you have a production function, you have one axis, you have another axis. On this axis you have y, or sometimes little y. Sometimes in economics, little y means per worker, big y means gross or total output. And here we put labor. Uh, let's try to do this. We also have a similar chart, y or big y, and here we have capital. So, for a given fixed quantity of capital here, so in this chart, capital is constant or unchanging. So, for a given fixed quantity of capital, how output changes with increasing the number of workers? The answer is, it always increases. No matter what the quantity of capital, adding one more worker can never possibly lower production. It can only increase production. So, it is an upward sloping, and a differently saying, it is an increasing function, but the slope itself, which measures the marginal productivity, again from microeconomics, the slope itself is decreasing. In other words, each new worker will produce or contribute less and less to the total output. Uh, imagine a big well that uh, people have to dig. You have one worker, he is digging, then two, three, four. Ultimately, there is some sort of clogging. These workers can't work together. Or they have only two shovels. So one, two, three, four workers will increase the overall productivity. But if you have 10 or 100 workers with two shovels, they will contribute little to the total output. How do we look at the marginal? Well, this is the simple way to look at it. This is number of workers, two, three, four. So the first worker is, this is the contribution for the first worker. This is the first line. Then I use black color. And the contribution of the second guy is this. In other words, if we have two guys, the first produces this much, and the second produces this much. Well, what about the third guy? You can see the way I have, oops, I have drawn it. The way I've drawn it, the third person's contribution is a lot less. An example will be workers with a taxi. One worker can drive the taxi, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. The second guy can drive it, maybe 10 or the rest. If I have a third person, he'll be able to contribute very little with one single taxi. In other words, one guy can drive it 12, the second can drive it 10 hours, the last one at best can drive it for another two. Again, scarcity of time in this particular case. So, what's the next? The next one is again contributing even less. So when we have each additional or each marginal worker contributing less and less to total output, we call this, it's a general law in economics, the law of diminishing returns. So this is the first return. The second return of the second is diminishing from the first, and the third is diminishing from the second. So, the law of diminishing returns, sometimes also called the law of diminishing marginal returns. 
In other words, the marginal contribution, contribution is the same in this case as return, the marginal contribution shrinks from worker to worker. Now, absolutely the same logic applies to the other one. We have, let's say, one worker, and that worker has got some capital. Well, again, scarcity of time gets to play in here. That guy's got a taxi. He may drive it for 12 hours, get some productivity. Well, you add to him a computer. He can add some more advertising and further increase his productivity. You add to him a wireless radio. He can get some phone calls. You get to him a GSM. So he can increase with capital more and more his productivity but ultimately no matter how much capital you endow this person his productivity will be relatively limited in the end of the day he's gonna drive at most for 24 hours and he'll be cherry picking the best customers with the best trips but at the end of the day he's gonna be making only so much so at first a taxi improvement then so forth and at the end no matter how much capital you give that worker his marginal productivity is not going to be increasing you can think of it uh, bigger terms and let's say a trucking firm you have let's say 50 workers working with 20 trucks, with 30 trucks, with 50 trucks, with 100 trucks, with 200 trucks, with 1,000 trucks. So at a certain point, if when they have 50 workers, whether they have 200 trucks or 2,000 trucks, it doesn't matter. So again, the same picture applies. I'm not going to draw the details. It is the same logic, the same everything. We'll need this, we call it production function. We'll need it later on for economic growth. For economic growth. All right, so what is important to understand, at least from this here? If we have, let's say, L constant, and in Bulgaria, let's say we have one million workers a good way to increase the average productivity per worker is to increase the overall capital in other words increasing capital increases the average productivity per worker increasing capital can come from only one single place investments in other words, the only way to increase capital is to invest in capital. And investments come from one and one source only. That is savings. So savings in this sense is the driver of long-term economic growth. Okay? So you have to understand that if you increase a capital by a certain unit, the productivity doesn't jump tomorrow and that's the end of it. For example, you have a 10-year child or let's say a student, uh, you just give him a laptop, doesn't mean he increases his productivity and that's the end of it. Well, within a month, he's got a better learning. He will use the computer better. We call this increased productivity. You have the same student, you have the same uh, laptop, but he increases his productivity. Sometimes this type of productivity increase is called increase of productivity based on human capital. Better way to manipulate the computer or the truck or whatever the machine is sometimes called worker skills is associated with human capital. So, some of the sources I'm getting now to economic growth are increasing capital availability per worker and increasing skills levels, which is the same as human capital. And the source of human capital is 
Savings, of course. That's a bonus point for the guy there. All right, so we move on. Let's see what else I have. Marginal product of capital, diminishing marginal uh, productivity of capital, similar with labor. Yes, one last point to make is that of productivity shocks. All right, so what is a productivity shock? So a productivity shock, one way to think about productivity shock, productivity shock is a change in the shape of the production function. So if this is our production function and you have here output, you have here, doesn't matter, let's say labor, some sort of a change in the shape, if it is higher, means a positive productivity shock. Positive productivity shock, sometimes also supply shock. Supply shock. So, supply shock, sometimes known as productivity shock when the shock is positive it shifts the output or the production curve upward in other words for any given labor for any given quantity of labor if you are producing some units you will be producing now a little bit more. This would be a positive production shock. Similarly, a negative production shock will be, in exactly the same logic goes, when the shape maybe first goes like this and then it flattens out rapidly, maybe. Again, the curve shifts down. Okay, so when the curve shifts down, we have two words describing it. One is called negative. So you have a negative supply shock. And the other one which is used in the literature, which has the same meaning, is adverse. Adverse simply means affecting in a negative way, in a bad way, so adverse. Alright, now what might be these supply shocks? These supply shocks could be a war, could be a tanker stuck in the Strait of Hormuz, so oil tankers can't move and if they can't move we're out of let's say crude oil. Uh, it could be uh, let's say Mr. Putin turning the natural gas to Ukraine in an attempt to hurt Europeans and consider his geopolitical concerns. All right? It could be nature Frost, okay? Just recently we had, like two weeks ago, uh, mid January in China, it was such a huge snow with snowstorms that it cut transportation, power, etc. That was a terrible adverse supply shock delivered by nature. Uh, sometimes adverse supply shocks. We have a general, recently, a general new term has come. We call it a Katrina, all right? Katrina. So a hurricane will be an example. So sometimes by just saying, well, here's a Katrina, sometimes means, well, means symbolically a negative supply shock. A nature that affects, natural event that affects the economy in a bad way. All right, so we could have positive ones. Uh, an excessively mild weather could be an example. 
uh, usually within the positives will be an innovation, a technological breakthrough. So they could have very different uh, ones. They could be also as a shock government regulations. Suddenly, the government says, everybody's got to check himself for AIDS. This means long lines rather than me working here, I'm going to be waiting in the hospital to get my blood, all right? So, just an example of a government regulation. We can get to hundreds of different government regulations that usually, uh, let's say, deliver a negative adverse shock. Uh, most of the times, government delivers negative uh, supply shocks to the economy as opposed to positive. All right, let's see what else we have. Now, you have to understand that these supply shocks and the change of the curve is different from changes in labor and different from changes, changes in capital. If it's different from both, then the supply shock is a shock to pure productivity. In other words, pure productivity goes up or down. Uh, the supply shock could be, let's say, uh, Hurricane Katrina wipes out a bunch of refineries. It suddenly destroys and reduces capital. So you can have a supply shock that literally reduces capital disrupts communications, transportations. So for the same, same amount of workers, you have a lot less available capital. So that's a, that's a different type of shock. You have to be uh, clear whether the shock... Well, another great example that's coming to mind is the Black Death. You heard these guys in the 13th century? Half of Europe died because of a disease, right? So. Half of Europeans simply died. This was a phenomenal, get how absurd this sounds, productivity shock. How come? This was great, meaning the same amount of land before was worked, let's say, by 50 million Europeans. Now you have 25 million Europeans. So for each worker, there was twice more land, twice more agricultural tools, twice more animals, twice more of everything. You see how absurd it sounds? But that's how it is from an economic point of view. 25 million people died, but if you survived, that was great for you. But don't we see at the same time that adverse productivity shock if we consider the amount of people, the labor forces, because they like um, became twice as small. Twice as small? Well, well, well so the output, okay. You consider total output. When you consider total output, total output shrank. There is no question about it. Let's say total output went down by 25%. But because people went down by 50%, output per worker and output per productivity went up. So the standards of living went up. All right, 25 million people died, but that was from an economic point of view, a great shock of productivity. That was good. I guess. Again, we are facing here economic issues with moral issues, right? I mean, these don't have to coincide. I mean, how you judge it from some religious or ethical point of view is completely different from a pure economics. Pure economics will care. Did output increase? Did output per worker increase? Did wage level increase? Did, did standard of living increase? Again, we are looking at the same macroeconomic variables. All right, let's see what else we have. Well, we are moving on to unemployment. Let's hope I'll be able to get done with it today. Probably not. We'll continue next time. All right, so three, five is unemployment. So who is unemployed? Unemployed is someone who is willing to work, able or capable of working, of working age, and cannot 
find a job at the current market wages. Again, unemployment, the key here is current market wages. I have no problem finding work for the whole Chinese nation and all of Africa for one cent an hour, okay? For one cent an hour, I'm going to find an awful lot of work. And any government worker or, you know, uh, let's say, uh, a totalitarian mind can easily find for the whole world at one cent. And unemployment will be simply banished because you just give them some little work and that little work will, uh, will, will, sorry, that little pay will create a lot of work. So, unemployment, the key is at the current market wages. Uh, here's another one. Uh, government is, was thinking of raising minimum wages by 20%. Same. Why not by 50%? Why not by 100%? Well, better yet, why don't we just call the minimum wage 1 million euro a month? In one month, we'll be all millionaires and we'll be done with working, life, meaning retire, we can all retire, do all the things we want to do. Again, the point is that if the government raises the minimum wage above a certain level, it will cause or create unemployment because no employer will be willing to pay a million euro a month. No employer. So, you call it one million, every employer will just uh, leave his workers unemployed. So, the key again is you make the wage level close to zero, everyone will be easily employed. You make it to one million, nobody will be able to get a job. So the key to unemployment is that the wage should neither be too low nor too high. Well, what is about the right wage rate? Well, that is the market wage rate. So unemployment is related to someone who cannot find a job but is willing to work at current market wages. All right, so let's draw something of a pool here and see how we look at unemployment. So I found this a very helpful chart. It's remarkably simple, but I haven't seen any textbook. I've seen it when I was a student a long time ago. So number one is you have people who are Employed. These are people that work for money, for a living, for a wage. Then you have here unemployed. Unemployed. These are people who are trying to get a job but cannot get one at current prices. And these are called here not in the labor force, not in the labor force. So, I use the term labor force. What is the labor force? Well, the labor force is simply the pool of people that are either working or looking for work. So, the labor force is, in other words, employed plus the unemployed. So, here is this one, and I just shorten it with LF standing for labor force. Now, let's try a different one here. Different one is, what is this whole thing? Employed, unemployed, not in labor force. We simply call it the adult population. So, you have the adult population and then you have the labor force. So, the adult population is people working, trying to find a work, or not bothering to work. 
for some reason, maybe retire. Uh, we assume that the unemployment, uh, the unemployed people always try to find, try to find work. Yes, we assume that they are trying to find work. This is the assumption. If they are no longer trying to find work, they have a special name. We call them discouraged. Discouraged workers. So, these are workers who are trying to find jobs at current market wages. They've tried and tried and tried and they have given up. So, a discouraged worker means that he moves from the ranks of unemployed into the labor force. I have a question. Yeah, that's what in, in, a, a different way of thinking if the pool of discouraged worker rapidly rises and the unemployed shrinks, all that happens is this line here just shifts a little bit lower. So what has been found, for example, in the recession of 2001 and 2002, just recently, was that such was the rapid rise of discouraged workers that even though the economy wasn't creating jobs, the unemployment fell because a lot of the people stopped bothering to find work. So that's very common. Uh, same thing happened during the Great Depression, although again, that's, uh, I don't want to get into that right now. So these are called discouraged workers. Let's see what else we have. We have three ratios and let's consider each one. Three ratios, sometimes they're known as rate. They have a technical name because it's nice to know them because media uh, or statistical uh, agencies report on them through the media. So the first one is unemployment rates. <laughs> The second one is called participation rate. And let's see how they call the third one. The employment employment Ratio. So, the first one, unemployment is equals to unemployed divided by the labor force. So, this portion here, this portion here divided by the total labor, labor force gives you the unemployment. This is the most popular ratio. Today, let's say US unemployment stands at 5%. This is this portion here as a percentage of the labor force. So, out of the labor force, the employed are 95% and the unemployed are 5%. Next one is the participation rate, which is the labor force this is the labor force divided by the adult population. So this is this, these two parts together divided by the whole thing. Uh, what some or many economists in Bulgaria have widely recognized is that Bulgaria's macroeconomy has a wide, huge problem of the participation rate. And the labor force is tiny. We have too many children, too many retired people. And we also have too many government workers, but I don't want to get into the statistics and accounting of government workers. But the problem is 
For us, our labor force is too tiny relative to the overall adult population. Different way of saying is we have a very aging nation, and the few people that are capable to work, like me, were working for 10 years in the United States. Many of our young population is gone. You have a question? So do the people under 18 belong to the not in the labor force category? Uh, the answer is it depends on the legislation and it depends on the st statistical convention. Uh, for the United States, the answer is uh, over 16 unless in school. So, you dropped out of school, you're not in school, you're over 16, you're then, if you're looking for a job in the labor force. Again, so it depends on different legislation. So, this is a matter of convention. So, for each country, it's nice for you to understand what, it, what the number is, what implies. Is the cutoff 16 or 18 or 21 or whatever the number is, or maybe possibly even 14. So finally, we get to the employment ratio, which is employed, employed to the adult. So this is what is this employed to the overall adult population. And for us in Bulgaria, let me try to add, I mentioned is within the employed, you have two categories. The category of the private sector and the category of the government sector. Well, the government sector itself is not productive. It isn't producing anything. I'll be discussing this some other time. So what really matters in real life is the private sector relative either to the labor force or relative to the adult population. Here in Bulgaria, our number of private sector employees to the adult population is by far the worst in Europe, all right? Okay, so let's see what else we have here. All right, the next concept is that of unemployment spell. Unemployment spell. The unemployment spell, spell in English, spell of time, simply means a period of time. So the unemployment spell is the period for which the worker is continuously unemployed. Continuously unemployed. If he found a job, let's say, for one week, then it represents two different spells. So what you have here is, let's say, this is a lengthy spell of time, let's say six months, and he didn't work for six months. So if he couldn't find any job at any point for these six times, that's one <coughs> unemployment spell. Suppose now he finds for two weeks a job. Then what you have is one unemployment spell, I don't know, maybe of two months, and another unemployment spell of three and a half months. So you get two unemployment spells in this particular example. So the key is continuously unemployed, unemployed throughout every day during this period. And then with the spell you have the concept of the duration. So the duration is what it says, the number of days or the length of the unemployment spell. So in this particular case, six months is the duration of the first case. The second case was what? Uh, two months versus three and a half months in the second case. So the duration simply tells you the length. And now in intermediate macroeconomics, they get them to analyze, well, what's the average spell, what's the duration, what's causing it. I'm not trying to get into this. We have 15 minutes, correct? So in 15 minutes, what I want to do is cover the four major types of unemployment. So economists have typically understanding of four major types of unemployment.
Talmud, three of which are covered in the textbook, and one, surprisingly for me, at least I couldn't see it, is uh, not covered. I couldn't find it, but of course it exists, and it's there. Anyone can tell me which one is not covered? Alright, so, let's begin. Cyclical is covered on page 99, the second paragraph. Seasonal. So, I begin with a type of unemployment, not in the textbook, but of course it's common sense. It exists, it's present. Cyclical, sorry, sorry, seasonal relates to the seasons of the year. Seasons of the year, for example, seasonal unemployment. We may consider ourselves professors if we teach for eight months. For the other four, we are seasonally unemployed. Simply, universities don't work at that time. The classical example of seasonal unemployment is, of course, agricultural workers. Agricultural workers may have three, four, six, or eight months of steady unemployment, but once the snow falls, they don't have much work to do. So they can get to be unemployed. So the seasons of nature, spring, summer, winter, fall, drive some seasonality into employment. Another example of seasonality is <coughs> Christmas. On Christmas, usually right before Christmas, one, three, five weeks before Christmas, you have an awful lot of hiring, people are needed, they do whatever the Christmas, uh, Christmas selling or shopping is necessary. Once Christmas is over, they get to liquidate and in January they're unemployed. So anything that relates to seasons is uh, called seasonal. Usually statist statisticians change and modify the statistics for seasonality. In other words, they adjust them for seasonality. Sometimes they call it seasonally adjusted unemployment. Seasonally adjusted unemployment. So usually what you'll see in the US as well as Bulgaria and in any other uh, developed country that celebrates Christmas is that usually there is a major spike in unemployment sometime in January. So that is purely seasonal unemployment. These are workers that got jobs, I don't know, maybe October, all the way through December. In January they got unemployed, they're seasonally unemployed until they find the next job. Maybe they just wait for three months until spring comes and they you know, get work as agricultural workers. So, if you have an agricultural worker from, uh, let's say, uh, April all the way to September, and he's a Christmas worker for November and December, for the other months you call that person seasonally unemployed. He would like to find a job, he would want to get it, but he doesn't, he can't get it. But on Christmas, he's got his Christmas job, and in the summer, he's got his agricultural job. The second one is called frictional. Frictional is associated with natural movements in the labor market. He just hates, or somebody just hates his boss and says, I can't stand this guy, so I'm going to get me another job. And he just leaves, and three weeks later, he finds another job. So he was frictionally unemployed. The classical example of frictionally unemployed, I think I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, was the kid getting out of high school, he got his diploma today, he wants to find a job today, but of course he can't find the same day. He might, it might take him a month, it might take him a year to find a job. So in between getting out of school and then until we find a first job, that's a typical example of frictional unemployment. Similarly with college students like you guys. For example, you're a uh, graduate and then you try to find a job. Well, you're probably not going to begin on day one. Maybe you'll begin on the third month. So in between, you will be 
unemployed. Another type of frictional unemployment will be someone who fell out of the labor force uh, and he re-enters the labor force because, let's say, the economy is really good and he tries to find a job and for the first three weeks or three months until he finds a job, he'll be what we call frictionally unemployed. Another example will be someone who's been on sick leave for, let's say, six months or a year. He or she was uh, recovering from some major illness associated with a surgery. The doctor said, well, you're not going to be back to work for at least a year. So the person just left his job. So he feel or she feels fully recovered, starts looking for a job. Again, that will be some sort of frictional unemployment. So, these are examples of frictional unemployment. The definition textbook gives is unemployment that arises as workers search for suitable jobs and firms search for suitable workers. So, frictional is associated with making the match. All right? Making the match was my first example, the guy hates his boss, so he's trying to find another business for the same pay, but a nicer boss. All right, then we have structural. Structural unemployment is associated with some sort of malstructuring in the economy. Malstructuring may occur or usually uh, is driven by a mismatch of worker skills. Let me explain this. You have a rapidly rising and growing telecom industry and at the same time, at least for the United States, you have a rapidly shrinking some other industrial industry, let's say uh, automating. So, well, on the one hand, you have computer software businesses and internets and dot coms and telecoms eager to find guys, their business is expanding. At the same time, uh, auto workers are getting laid off, meaning that uh, Detroit is not able to produce so many, uh, let's say, automobiles, and it's possibly shrinking. And because of a shrinking industry, it's releasing the workers. You'll say, well, uh, all the workers can simply, those that are released can simply fill in the computer jobs, but unfortunately, that's not how it works. And the cause is skills, labor skills. In other words, you can't just get a worker who was doing the nuts and the bolts, and then you make him a program on our Fortran or, I don't know, HTML or some Java, etc. So, that's one of the fundamental reasons. So, structural is associated with some industries booming, and other industries shrinking. And the problem of booming and shrinking is that the booming industries do not and cannot absorb those from the shrinking industries for two fundamental reasons. Skills I mentioned, and the second one is geography. In other words, Detroit is laying off people and Silicon Valley is trying to hire them. Well, they first got to learn how to program Java or SQL, but then they have to move to Silicon Valley, all right? So, you need them with the right skills at the right place. So, when an industry is shrinking, usually people, especially if they're middle-aged, in their 50s or early 60s, they're not willing to learn a brand new profession. I mean, they did for 30 years the same thing. They don't want to change their job or profession, but also they already have, they've been living in this town for, let's say, 30 years. They already have their house. It's fully paid for. They got their friends, relatives, etc. They don't want to move to California. 
All right, so they are not willing to move and sometimes they're not willing to acquire the skills. So these are the fundamental causes associated with a shrinking or rapidly expanding industry. And finally, we have cyclical unemployment. Let me wipe this off. Four. Cyclical unemployment is associated with the business cycle. With the business cycle means as the economy booms, the cyclical unemployment shrinks, possibly turns negative, and as the economy shrinks or goes into a recession, the cyclical unemployment rises substantially. All right, let's draw a little picture over here and let's provide an example. So, you have the graph here. This is time. Uh, 2000 was the peak of the economy around 2001. Uh, okay, so let, let's try to do this. 2000, the economy was going down up until 2002. So, you have 2000, you have 2002. 2001 was a recession. Then, the economy is booming. You have real estate and all the good stuff associated with it. Uh, refrigerators, stoves, TVs, VCRs, etc. And now, 2007, the real estate market is collapsing, and in 2008, economists believe the economy is in recession. So, what we have here is the long-term growth trend. This is the long-term growth trend. Here you have the economy moving around the long-term growth trend. And as the economy is booming, what we have here, the difference, is that cyclical unemployment. So, we have this long-term growth trend called, long-term growth trend, its corresponding unemployment is called natural. Rate of unemployment. So, the natural rate of unemployment is this unemployment which corresponds perfectly to the long term growth trend. So, here, the economy here produces less than the long-term growth rate. We call this the natural output rate. So, natural rate of unemployment slash output, natural rate of output. So, if you're producing less than the natural rate of output, you will have some cyclical unemployment. Over here, as the economy is booming, you will have a negative cyclical unemployment. So now, as the real estate uh, sector has turned down in 2006 and has gone into bust in 2007, you have a lot of people that are cyclically unemployed, but you also have structurally unemployed. You have realtors. Half the realtors in the U.S. are now technically unemployed, meaning they're trying to find sales and customers, but they can't. Mortgage brokers that were underwriting mortgages, many of them are out of work, okay? So these mortgage brokers, they are trying to find jobs as mortgage brokers. Probably the mortgage industry is not going to be booming anytime soon again. So they have to find some other 
jobs, okay? So, what you have here is a number of industries that are rapidly shrinking because of a bust in that particular industry, but also because of an overall macroeconomic recession driven possibly by the bust of these industries. So, this would be cyclical unemployment. And we have, let's try this. 3.6, it should take me at most two minutes. Uh, I don't want to get into the details of Oaken's law. For an introductory course, you should just know what it is. So, an Oaken's law is a relationship between products or GDP and unemployment. So, you have output, you have unemployment, and there is a basic relationship. And the relationship is that one percent of unemployment drives a 2% in output. How is this used? Well, just recently uh, the Labor Department, Bureau of Labor Statistics, reported that unemployment went up by almost 1% in a very short period of time. So what the economist said, oh, output was like, for example, 1.9%, now we're going to lose 2%, so it is minus 0.1%. So if we lost or increased unemployment by 1%, GDP went down by 2%. So from this relationship, some economists inferred that the economy in January has likely slipped into a recession. So, the point here to make is that this is called, in economics, as in common sense, is called rule of thumb. This is a rough rule. This is not perfect. This is not always the same. It could be 2.1%. It could be 1.9%. There is also different growth modification. But the idea is fairly basic. If you're a politician and try to reduce unemployment by 3%, you'd better increase growth by 6%. Our Bulgarian government stated, our goal is to increase, uh, sorry, to reduce unemployment from 10% to 7%. For example, that's actually politician talk. The economy is growing at 6%. So, if they really mean and plan to do that, the economy should be growing at 12%. Well, we know, or every common sense economist know that 7 is beyond our capabilities, let alone 12. But politicians just keep talking that we're going to reduce 3% by uh, unemployment by 3%. Well, it is not real. And that's what Oaken's Law kind of like means. So, the Oaken's Law is this. Relationship. You guys happy for today? Yes. All right, guys. So let's turn around and stop and see. Really, have the basis.